Well, for three months, from Fort Sumter to July 4th, 1861, when Lincoln calls Congress to meet in special session, for three months, Lincoln runs the government all by himself. There's no Congress meeting. There is no, the judiciary, he doesn't have to listen to. He appropriates money by himself. He raises troops by himself. He suspends the writ of habeas corpus in Maryland by himself. What authorized him to do this? There's, he's doing things which the Constitution says other branches of the government are supposed to do. When Congress meets, he says, well, I've done all this. Have I violated the Constitution? He says, no, I have not violated the Constitution. I have gone beyond the Constitution. <laughs> I have gone beyond it. In other words, with merit, he says, the Constitution was not conceived for a situation like we face. And therefore, it is irrelevant to the situation I faced when war began and Congress was not in session. Of course, he could have called Congress immediately, but he waited till it to, for it to meet on July 4th, which was, of course, a very symbolic day, um, et cetera. And then he calls upon Congress to retroactively endorse or legitimate all the things he has done, which they do with the exception of the suspension of habeas corpus. They authorize the money, they authorize the troops. Obviously, what are they going to do? The war is going on. But they do not retroactively authorize the suspension of habeas corpus. Nonetheless, and we'll talk about this down the road, Lincoln continues to suspend the writ of habeas corpus now and then uh, during, during the Civil War. The Constitution on this point, by the way, is maddening, maddeningly vague or Another point, which I always badger into people, it shows you the problems of the passive voice. It says something to the effect, the writ of habeas corpus may be suspended in emergency. But it doesn't say by whom. Who has the authority to do that? It doesn't say by the president, by the Congress. It just says may be suspended. Most authorities think they meant the Congress could do it. But Lincoln said, well, it may be suspended, so I'm suspending it. Lincoln when Congress met, sent a message, which is one of his more famous pieces of writing, explaining what he had done and justifying the Northern position in the Civil War. He identifies, as he would during the entire war, he identifies the Union war effort with the deeply held values of Northern society. Political democracy, equality of opportunity, that's what's at stake here. The war, he said, presents the question to the whole family of man whether a constitutional republic, a democracy, um, a government of the people by the same people can or cannot main maintain its integrity against its own domestic foes. He says it raises the question whether in democracies there's a fatal weakness. And this is a very profound little question. Must a government be too strong for the liberties of his own people or too weak to maintain its existence? How do you balance the strength of the government versus the liberties of the people? And, you know, we've been debating that ever since, as you know. Um, he says the legality of what has been done is questioned. People question whether what he's done was legal. Well, here's his answer. The president, he says, is enjoined by the Constitution to ensure that the laws are enforced. That is part of the job of the president, to ensure that the laws are enforced. But must they, the laws, be allowed to fail, even had it been perfectly clear by the, that by the use uh, of the means necessary to their execution, some single law made in extreme tenderness of the citizen's liberty should, to a very limited extent, be violated. See, in other words, he's saying, maybe to maintain the rule of law, you might, under certain circumstances, have to violate one law. Or to put it more directly, he says, more famously, um, are all the laws but one to go unexecuted and the government itself go to pieces, lest that one law be violated? Is it legitimate to violate one law? I guess he's talking about habeas corpus here. Is it legitimate to violate one law so that the entire edifice of law survives? Or must you have the edifice collapse so that one law is not violated? 
This is um, an impeccable argument, but it is also a loaded gun which passes down from generation to generation, which is seized upon by subsequent wartime presidents to justify egregious violations of civil liberties in wartime, such as happened in World War I, in World War II with the internment of Japanese Americans, has happened during the War on Terror. Every president who seeks to exert his authority in war goes back to Lincoln's argument that it, is it may be necessary, even though they don't admit they're violating the law, they also say, if it is necessary to do so to maintain the security of the nation, then, uh, then that, is, that is okay. Most of the successes are much less um, careful, so to speak, about which laws are violated and which aren't than Lincoln uh, was. But anyway, the main point is Lincoln is, makes the war a world historical event. This is not just a war within the United States, he says. It has world significance. It is a, well, here's what he says. Again, here is the appeal to the free labor values. This is essentially a people's contest. On the side of the Union, it is a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life. This mobility, opportunity, this, this is at stake for the entire world, he says, not just for the United States in this, in this battle. Lincoln is very, very shrewd or adept in mobilizing public sentiment through appeal, as I say, to basic values which he very well understands.